Make sure you're paying attention so you can be exempted from your assignment today. All right. Today we're talking about American core values, or what we call the American political culture. These are widely shared values, widely shared values that most Americans have. Widely shared values in our country. You can think of political culture as our core values and beliefs politically. They often affect policy debates in the United States. If a policy is contrary to these core values, they typically have a hard time getting adopted. But if they're in accordance to these values, they have an easier time getting adopted. So let's talk about some of these core values. Uh, first is equality. Everyone should be treated fairly. Everyone should be treated fairly. What is the definition of fair, though, is up for interpretation. Another core value that we have here in the United States, some countries don't have, is free enterprise capitalism. We all remember, but back in the days when we were still the 13 colonies, one of the gripes that we had about the British government is that they imposed mercantilism on the United States. They controlled the 13 colonies economy, and from then on, we're kind of allergic to government trying to control the marketplace. People should be able to compete in the marketplace with very little government intervention. With very little government intervention. This is not something that some other countries have, like China, for example. This is not one of their tenants. There's more control by government there because this is not part of their core values. The government should not control the means of production. So things that are contrary to free enterprise capitalism, they have a hard time getting through um, and being adopted. Like universal health care, for example, is something that's very difficult to adopt in the United States because some people believe that it's contrary to the idea of free enterprise capitalism. Next, individualism and self-reliance, being independent from the government specifically. So independence from the government. This came about in the United States, this value develop in the United States because of the Wild West. As America, we all remember Manifest Destiny, as America expanded westward and people started migrating westward, who isn't there all the time? Who wasn't there all the time? Go to that. That as people started migrating westward, right, the government is not there. The presence of the government is not there all the time. So people have to fend off for themselves. People have to be relying on themselves. Whenever you hear the phrase American individualism or rugged individualism that was developed in the Wild West, where the government's presence wasn't well established in the Wild West, and people kind of enjoyed that certain degree of freedom, that certain degree of independence away from government control. Next, limited government. We talked about this before. A political system in which government is restricted. This is one of our founding values. These are one of our founding principles. Ever since the Articles of Confederation and the US Constitution, we've had a limited government. How do you know our government's limited? What limits our government? Everybody should know this right now. Checks and balances, all that can be found where? What tells us what government can and cannot do? Constitution. Constitution. The fact that we have a written constitution limits our government. It tells us what government can and cannot do. It establishes boundaries that government is not supposed to cross. The rule of law is along the same lines. Everybody should know this by now. The rule of law means no one is what? Above the law. No one is above the law. Again, that is one of our founding values. That's one of the things that are core to the American identity. And then we have things like democracy and republicanism. This begs the question. If all these are core values, if all these are something that is widely shared in America, how come we have such conflict in this country? How come liberals and, and Democrats and Republicans and conservatives are always at each other's throats? It's not because we don't have the same values. For the most part, we do. Republicans and Democrats do. It's just the way we interpret those values differ. I'll give you two examples. The first one is equal opportunity. Alyssa believes equal opportunity means that government should not intervene. People should succeed and fail on their own. While David believes that free enter of, uh, equal opportunity means that government is supposed to promote equal opportunity, it's supposed to ensure that everybody has an equal opportunity to succeed. Like, for example, when it comes to affirmative action, which person would probably be okay with affirmative action? 
David, but because David is probably a what? A liberal or a conservative? They're going to be a liberal. A liberal and conservative, they have the same value, but the way they interpret it opens its opens interpretation to whether or not government should be involved or government should not be involved. Most of the time when conservatives interpret these values, it means that government should not be involved. But when liberals interpret these values, um, they believe that government should play a role. Again, it's not that we don't have the same values, it's because we interpret them differently. Free enterprise capitalism, for example, will be another value that can be interpreted differently. Alyssa believes that free enterprise capitalism means the government should stay out of the economy. The marketplace should be free of government control. While David believes that the government should be there making sure that monopolies are eliminated, that there's competition in the marketplace, that there's healthy competition. David believes there's a role for government to play in the economy, while Alyssa doesn't believe so. Again, same value, different interpretation. So, all this to say that these, this, these different interpretations of our core values lead to different political ideologies. Liberalism, conservatism, communism, fascism. They arise not from different core values, but from the interpretation of these core values. Different ideologies are represented in government. We have liberals and, and conservatives mostly in our government, which means there's always conflict leading to conflict. There's a constant clashing of opinions. Again, not because of different values, but because of different interpretations of those values. Today, our main topic is political socialization. You need to know the definition. So before you walk in here today on your exam day, you know what political socialization means. Political socialization is a process in which an individual, another key word is, acquires his political values and attitudes. The process in which an individual, the key word is, acquire his values and his beliefs politically anyway. This is a process that's going on with you guys right now internally. It's still going on with me right now. Right now, you're acquiring values, you're acquiring beliefs about politics and about government that will define you or who you are politically. This process is what made you who you are. If you think you're a liberal, it's because of the political socialization that happened in your lifetime. If you think you're a conservative, same thing. This is the process in which uh, is what made you who you are politically. Now, Again, this is an ongoing process. It's not going to stop until you're dead. But the older you get, these values and beliefs, they get firmer and firmer. They get harder and harder to let go. If you don't believe me, try arguing politics with your grandparents and see if you can change your mind. But likely, you won't be able to because those values and beliefs are pretty much entrenched within them. You are lucky in that right now, you live at an age where these values and beliefs are very flexible. Once you find a convincing argument, you start adopting new values and beliefs, and it's very easy for you to let go of the ones that you hold dear right now. I guarantee you 10 years from now, some of you that believe that you're a liberal may not be so 10 years from now, and vice versa. Because again, this process is an ongoing one. There are many different factors that contribute to this process where you acquire your values and beliefs from. School, family, the media, gender, the environment, the group that you live in. If you're surrounded by liberals, you're going to adopt those values. You're going to adopt those beliefs and you're more likely to be a liberal. In the Rio Grande Valley, for example, is the majority of us here liberal or conservative? Liberal. And that has an impact on your political socialization. However, which, on the, which of these factors is the most influential? Here's, here's is very important. Media is very important. What one thing trumps them all? Family. Your parents is the most influential factor to your socialization. Your parents is where most of your political values and most of your political beliefs come from. Why? Because they have such a monopoly on your time. Whenever you're parents talk about politics at the dinner table, you're acquiring values, you're acquiring those beliefs. Whenever your dad talks about Joe Biden when he's watching the news, you're acquiring those values and you're acquiring those beliefs. In fact, the best predictor of how an individual will vote 
is basing that prediction on how his parents voted. If your parents are Republican conservatives, you're probably going to become a Republican conservative and vice versa. I know most of you here live in an age where you think yourself a rebel and a free thinker, but statistically, politically anyway, you're just going to be just like your parents. Either you're going to be a liberal like them or a conservative like them. You might be an exception to that rule, but the rule is still in place. More often than not, people mimic their parents' political values and their political beliefs. You know, I have any questions on that? Moving on. Oh, by the way, which of these has become more important recently? The media yeah. has become more and more important. Family is still the most important, but as more and more of you are ignoring your parents at the dinner table and looking up information on Reddit and social media, it has become more and more important. Okay. School can also be important. Have you ever had a teacher that was very vocal about his politics, about his political opinions? Because he's such an authority figure, you might have acquired his values and his beliefs as well, and that contributes to your political socialization. Right now, I try not to do that, because I don't want to affect your political socialization. But I do have my own values, I do have my own biases, and sometimes it kind of um, seeps through the way I teach things. I try not to, but I'm only human. But when you get to college, your teachers, your professors are not going to be handcuffed by the same rules as we are handcuffed with. They're going to be more open about what they believe in. They're going to be more open about their political beliefs and values. And you're going to be more affected by those values and beliefs. I'll give you a freebie. On your test, on Unit 4, they're going to ask you, which of these scenarios shows political socialization? It's going to be a scenario where an individual acquires a value, whether it's from his professor, whether it's from his parents, whether it's from social media, that's political socialization. Any questions? Moving on, there's many other factors that affect somebody's political values and somebody's political beliefs. There are four main ones that you need to remember for AP government. Number one is the generational effect. As you grow up together as a generation, what's your generation called? As you're growing up together, you're going to have common experiences. You're going to have common experiences. Experiences that you guys are going to share in common. And those experiences, as you come of age, coming of age is probably between 15 to about 25. These are the most influential years of your lifetime when it comes to politics. Whatever you experience during those years when you come of age will have a big impact on your political values and your political beliefs. So of people that come of age at the same time adopt the same values, adopt the same beliefs, because for the most part, they had the same experiences that shaped those values and beliefs. So you guys right now, because you're experiencing the same things as a generation, you're going to have some values that are going to be similar because you're shaped by the same experiences. So I'll give you an example. People that became of age during the Great Depression, where people felt vulnerable, where people felt that they had no other choice but to, but to depend on who? the government for help, they're more likely to accept government help. Because they saw the good that it could do when they were coming of age, when they were teenagers, when they became in, in their early 20s. So people that came of age during the Great Depression, that experience shaped their political attitude towards government in that they are more readily acceptable or accepting of government help and government welfare. Your grandparents, the baby boomers, the people that were born after what? What they call baby boomers. They were born after what? After World War II, when the soldiers came home and they just made babies, right? So baby boomers that grew up during the period of time in the United States called the Cold War, where we are in a quasi-war with who? Who was the enemy? Russia. 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 The Soviet Union was the enemy. Um, they grew up with the sense that there's this big bad, there's this enemy called the Soviet Union. And anything that the Soviet Union stands for was bad, was evil, including socialism and communism. These were associated with the Soviet Union, so therefore they're bad things because they are the ideology of the enemy. So today, policies that might be socialistic in nature, people that came of age during the Cold War, particularly the baby boomers of the Cold War, 
they're more easily um, rejecting these ideologies. They automatically think that they're bad, not because of whether or not they're actually good for the country or bad for the country, it's because they're associated with the Soviet Union. So when your grandparents say something is communist or something is socialist, is that a positive thing or a negative thing? It's often a negative thing, right? Sometimes they just say something is communist just because they don't like it. It's not because they, it's actually communist. Most people don't know what communism and socialism are. I bet you some of you here don't know what communism and socialism are. But when your grandparents say that something is socialist or communist, they associate it with something that's negative because it's associated with the Soviet Union. That's why things today, like free college tuition, right, or universal health care, things that have hints of socialism in them and hints of communism in them, it's very hard to adopt those policies in the United States because the baby boomers that vote a lot in the United States, they tend to have a negative attitude towards socialism and communism because these were the ideologies of the enemy when they were growing up. So negative attitudes towards socialistic and communistic values and ideas. So we're probably, probably never going to get social uh, universal health care until your grandparents die off. Because again, they're more likely to be against it. They're associated with the enemy at the time. Also, during the Cold War, your grandparents lived uh, at a time where the prospect of nuclear annihilation was something that could be real. That at any point, when they were growing up, the world can be wiped away. So, when it comes to the conflict between national security and civil liberties, baby boomers tend towards what? National security or civil liberties? Civil liberties. It's More likely for national security because they grew up in an age where national security was very vulnerable because of nuclear bombs. Aren't those the conservatives now, though, the baby boomers? That's why. And who's more likely to support national security over civil liberties? Conservatives or liberals? Conservatives. Does that make sense? All right. When it comes to military spending, right, well, baby boomers tend to favor military spending as well. Because again, back then, we were competing with the Soviet Union, and they have this idea that the American military must be up to date, must be able to compete with the Soviet Union. That's why they're more likely to support military spending, for example. Any questions, guys? Again, as you grow up, common experiences that you experience can shape your generation's political values and your political beliefs. I'll give you another example. My generation, millennial generation, and somewhat your generation as well, we're often accused of being lazy. We're often accused of wanting everything to be handed by the government, right? Mooching off government welfare and government social programs. You probably heard your grandparents or many of your parents say, when I was growing up, I worked so that I could put myself to college. I didn't depend on the government to pay for my college. Or when I was growing up, I had a house by the time I was 25. Right? You've probably heard that before. Well, it's because when they were growing up, when they were coming of age, things were different back then. In 1970, when the baby boomers were getting into college, that's the cost of tuition at one of the most prestigious universities in the United States, about $3,000. Back then, that means you only had to work. If you're going to put yourself through college, right, and you don't depend on the government, you only had to work about five hours a week in order to afford that college tuition. In 2014, that same university is charging $50,000, which means to put yourself through college, it would mean working 17 hours a week. When your grandparents say, why don't you just work? Why don't you just get a job so that you can put yourself to college? It's because when they were growing up, that was a possibility. Five hours a week, they can afford college. But nowadays, because tuition is so high, that's really not realistic for people of my generation and people of your generation. We're going to have to work so much, taken away from our college education, in order to afford college. That's why people of our generation, we tend to want who? To help. 
Does that make sense? Mortgage costs of houses are also skyrocketing, right? So realistically, by 25, back then, your parents and your grandparents are able to afford housing. But today, housing is so expensive. Things have changed. That's why people tend to gravitate towards more government help today than before. So baby boomers, they tend to value independence, self-reliance, not relying too much on the government. So things like free college tuition, that's something that's unfathomable to a lot of your grandparents because when they were growing up, they didn't need the government's help. While people of my generation and your generation were, were more likely to seek government help because the experiences that we have as a generation will shape our political values and will shape our political attitudes. Does that make sense for everybody? And who often gets what they want? Which of these three generations often get what they want? The boomers do because they what? They vote, they vote more than we do. All right, another factor that can change our values and beliefs is the life cycle factor. This is changes, changes in one's political values as they grow up. Changes in one's political values as they grow up. As you grow up, you're going to have experiences that can shape your political attitudes. Why? Because as you grow up, your priorities will change. What you find important will change. What you find as priority will change. Right now, in your life cycle, you're a regular. You're going to almost go to the university, right? What are some of your priorities when you become a university student? To pay for school. Pay for tuition, right? Some of you are going to be abandoned. Abandoned is not the right word. You're going to be kicked out by your parents, and you're going to be forced to become more independent. So you're going to have to pay for your own rent. You're going to have to pay for your own health insurance. You're going to have to pay for your own car. But during these times, because your priorities are different, you're going to be more likely to want who to help? The government to help. You're going to seek government aid because maybe you're faced with these responsibilities that you're not going to be able to fulfill on your own. But then you become an adult, you get a job, you get a mortgage, you get a family. Right? Your priorities shift. It's not about paying for college anymore. It's about taking care of your children. It's about maybe you have a business and operating that business. So suddenly, you become more conservative. You want taxes to be lower. You want government regulation on your business specifically to go away. Right? So your values and your beliefs, they, become, they begin to morph as your priorities change as you're growing up. Your priorities right now will not be the same priorities as you're going to have 10 years from now. Right now, you might be really concerned about college tuition, but 10 years from now, that's not going to be a concern of yours because you're going to have other priorities. All right, experiences of growing up can shape one's political, uh, political I'm sorry, priorities and political attitude. That's the key word there, priorities. So as you're growing up, your priorities will change. That's what life cycle effect means. It's easy, right? And as those priorities change, your political attitude will also change. So for example, younger people, they tend to be more liberal in their attitude. The older you are, the ten, you tend to be more conservative. Anyone have any questions? The, la the next one is the effect of major events or major trends on your political values and your political attitude. So events in American history, particularly traumatic ones, can have a big impact on people's values and beliefs. They can make them more conservative or they can make them more liberal. For example, the Watergate scandal, where, especially Vietnam, where the Ameri um, American government lied, cheated, and committed crimes in the United States. How did that affect American values? Created distrust in the Very good. Americans begin to be more distrustful of the government. I don't know if you know this, but before Watergate in Vietnam, people generally liked their government. If you look at um, polls back then in World War I and World War II, the majority of Americans supported the government during those conflicts, even through the Great Depression. But then after Vietnam, after Watergate, those approval ratings began to go down. Today, Congress is lucky if they have a 30% approval rating. If Joe Biden gets 50% approval rating, that's already pretty good. But before Watergate, 
and before Vietnam, those are things that were taken for granted by the government. People generally supported their government. People generally trusted their government. But things changed because of these important events that happened in American history. My generation, the event that shaped my generation for the most part is 9-11. Um, it had different effects on different people. You know, some people became more conservative. Some people began emphasizing national security over civil liberties. Some people became more liberal. Some people became emphasizing civil liberties over national security. But again, it had a tremendous impact in my generation. Social trends, like social media becoming more and more of a thing, right? Right now, what issue is more, uh, has become more important because social media is such a big thing, a uh, ubiquitous thing in American society today? What's an issue that's more important today? The use of free speech. Free speech, right? Free speech issues. Privacy is something very important today, right? Because of how the ubiquity of social media in American society. Give me an event that's probably going to be the one that shaped a lot of your political values and beliefs, your generation at least. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter would be one when George Floyd died. What else? The overturning of Roe versus Wade. The overturning of Roe versus Wade. That's a big issue. That's a big event. What else? Pandemic. The pandemic. That's probably going to be the major one. The pandemic is going to change your values. It's going to change what you believe in. It's going to shape it, whether it be to more towards liberalism or more towards conservatism, that's yet to be seen, but it's going to have an impact. Anyone have any question? The last major factor to your political values and beliefs and how they change is globalization. Globalization refers to the exchange of political values between countries. The exchange of political values between countries. At the turn of the 20th century, things change. Technology improved in terms of communication and transportation. And countries begin lo began lowering their trade barriers, began removing tariffs, and more free trade is happening. That facilitated an easier exchange of goods and services between countries, right? But not only that, it also facilitated an easier exchange of ideas and values. Globalization means that today, we are affecting other countries' values and beliefs, American values and American beliefs, because we're such a powerful country, such an influential country around the world, we are affecting other people's values and beliefs. I lived, uh, I grew up in the Philippines, I was born there. A lot of Filipino values and Filipino beliefs are from you guys. They're American values, they're American beliefs, because of the close ties between the two countries, colonialism. Um, those values and beliefs permeated in my country. We've adopted those values and we adopted those beliefs. But it's not a one-way street. Not only are American values and American beliefs permeating other countries, other countries' values and beliefs are permeating America today. So I'll give you an example, right? Japan and Korea. After World War II, we became very, very close to these two Asian countries. And the value of capitalism and free enterprise economics, these are values that we gave Japan and South Korea that they adopted. Today, these two countries are one of the, are some of the wealthiest countries on the planet. Brands that you guys may not know are Japanese or South Korean are something that's ubiquitous in American society, like Toyota, for example, or Honda. The PlayStation that some of you play, that's Japanese, right? Some of you listen to K-pop or you watch anime, but not only uh, that's because of the American value of free enterprise capitalism. That's what made these countries wealthy today. But again, it's not a one-way street, it's a two-way street. Europe, for example, and European ideas that are sometimes bordering on socialism and communism, they're kind of permeating American politics today. So things like socialized healthcare, policies that they've adopted a long time ago that's being implemented around these Euro European countries, free college tuition, you see major politicians in the, in the United States talking about adopting these policies. When 10 years ago, it would have been inconceivable for politicians to talk about socialized medicine, because that's something that people rejected 10 years ago. That's something people don't talk about. 10 years ago, that's something today that a lot of politicians, a lot of major politicians, they talk about a lot. Any questions? All right, your job. Also, be here. I think all of you are paying attention. So. 
don't have to worry about that. So don't worry about your assignment for today uh, unless you've been absent. Some of those have puzzles you haven't done, so make sure that you do them. Uh, essay number one, you have two more chances to correct. One more tomorrow morning and then uh, the next day on Tuesday. Um, so make sure you have a submission ready for me by tomorrow. It doesn't matter if it's late. The only thing that matters is you have less chances to get your hundred. So if you haven't turned it in, make sure that you turn it in, get a grade in there at the very least. All right. If you don't know how to do these essays, make sure that you watch those videos. But for the first one, I'll try to guide you. This isn't U.S. History AP. That's hard. American, uh, in American government, AP, the argument of essay is a lot easier. Typically, all you need is four paragraphs. I'm good? Four paragraphs. They don't have to be lengthy. The first paragraph is dedicated to your thesis. You have to make a claim and then provide a line of reasoning to preview your arguments. Could be one sentence. That paragraph, that first paragraph, can be one sentence, and you'll get the point for it. You don't need context, right? Like in AP US history, just give me the thesis. Give me the claim, and then give me how you're going to argue for that claim. So this one's very simple. Look at your first essay. Develop an argument that explains which of these three models of represent democracy, participatory, elite, pluralist, best achieves the founder's intent for American democracy in terms of ensuring a stable government. How many claims can you make? Three. Three. You only have three choices. Either it's elite, participatory, or pluralist. And just, call, guys, some of you don't, some of you are too prideful. Some of you can get away with not doing this, but for most of you, just do it. Copy the prompt. So let's say you're going to choose elite. All you need to do is, Elite democracy best achieves a founder's intent for American democracy in terms of ensuring a stable government. Just copy it directly. You don't need to um, de elaborate with your uh, thesis. Then, your thesis has two parts. Your claim plus a line of reasoning. So that's my claim. Elite democracy best achieves a founder's intent for American democracy. Then I have to provide a line of reasoning. Don't get confused with this one. Line of reasoning is just a preview of the argument that you're about to make. You're just, pre you're just telling the grader, here's the arguments I'm about to make. I'm good? All right, so let's go to your body paragraphs. Again, your first paragraph can just be one sentence. It could just be a thesis, and you'll get the point for it. Let's go to your body paragraphs. Your body paragraphs supports your thesis. Whatever you write down, guys, has to support your thesis. So you need to... Uh, provide or describe evidence from these required documents. So your first evidence has to come from one of these three documents, Buddhist one, Fed 10, or U.S. Constitution. Your second piece of evidence, according to this prompt, says, use the second piece of evidence from another foundational document from the list, or your knowledge, your study of the electoral process. So some people get confused by this. Your first evidence has to come from one of these three documents. Sound good? So your first evidence has to come from these three. Where's your second evidence coming from? One of those three, or... The other ones that you didn't choose. So let's say I chose Buddhist number one for my first evidence. Evidence number two can come from any of these two, or from my study of the electoral process. The electoral process just means the voting process in the United States. They purposely make that very broad. This is a voting process. It could be pretty much anything that has to do with voting in the United States. So your second piece of evidence can come from any of the other two that you didn't pick, or your knowledge of the voting process. All good? On your body paragraphs, here's all you need to do. Describe the evidence, right? So let's say, you, uh, so you say in Brutus number one, um, Brutus says that state governments are preferable because people have more control over state governments. So you describe it. And then you need to explain how that evidence supports your what? Your thesis. Some of you always forget that. You provide this good evidence. You describe this evidence, right? And I can see how it's going to support the thesis, but you don't loop it back. You should always have a sentence that loops it back, that reminds the grader, Hey, 
everything that I just wrote is towards supporting my thesis. Now I'm good. You do that for the second set. You do that for the second evidence. So again, describe the evidence and then explain how your evidence ties into your thesis. So you're going to do that for the second evidence. The last paragraph is the one that people have trouble with. This one's very easy, guys. The last paragraph is not a conclusion. You don't need a conclusion. If you want to provide a conclusion, whatever. You can do that if you want to. But you don't have to. The last paragraph is about how well you can predict other arguments. So let's say I chose elite democracy, right? On this one, I have to provide an alternative claim. So what's the alternative claims? That participatory is what our founding fathers intended, or that what? Pluralist. Pluralist is what our founding fathers intended. And then, you need to provide an argument for that alternative claim. So basically, you're just doing the thesis all over again, but for a different claim. So you can say, some people might say that participatory democracy is what our founding fathers intended because of blah, 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 right? You provide an argument. And then, you need to argue against that argument. You can either do two things. Number one, you can explain why the argument that you just provided is invalid, why it's not very good, why it doesn't hold water. Or, another option for you is, admit that it's a good argument, that it's a sound, valid argument but explain why yours is better anyway. Does that make sense? So, two things. You can either tell me why that argument, that alternative argument that you just provided, is not very good, why it's invalid, or admit that it's valid, that admit it's a sound argument, but why yours is better anyway. Any questions, guys? Two more chances on, on essay number one. Essay number two is also tomorrow. Essay number two is easier, I think. If you're having trouble with these guys, I'm always here in the morning. Just let me know. After class, like today, we have some time left over. So just let me know. Get your hundreds, guys. It's a test grade. And I hope you a lot.